in the late 20s and early 30s at the time which the story of the Tigers happened, Green Bay, New York, the Bears, and the Cardinals were the only teams that still exist today that were in the NFL. And it was a total hand-to-mouth operation. I mean, most it was an exciting sport and it was starting to grow. But all of it was loosely organized. Why the Tigers were all but forgotten is an interesting question as you put forth. Um, and I've wondered about that. But they were. They were almost forgotten, and yet they were so very good. They were the best professional team in the country in 1929. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Hello, friends. It's Tim Hanlon. How are you? It's Good Seats Still Available, the curious little podcast that is devoted to what used to be in professional sports. Uh, as the announcer has said, and as I've uh, confirmed, uh, that is the place you were at. Thank you for joining us. Uh, if it's your first time, we uh, welcome you into the fold. If you've been here before, uh, hopefully we do not scare you away uh, in your return visit. So today, we're going to uh, go back into pro football, and uh, we're going to do something a little different here. We don't normally uh, focus on teams or leagues that were not, quote unquote, truly professional. Uh, but this was an interesting story that uh, caught my eye uh, and I thought uh, was uh, was worthwhile because it does have very strong elements into, uh, in this case, the early days of professional football, the NFL, uh, in its very sort of ragtag and uh, uh, scruffy days in the 1920s and 1930s. The topic we're going to be uh, focused on today is a team called the Memphis Tigers. And no, that's not the University of Memphis Tigers uh, that we know today. But as you will find out in this conversation, it kind of is. And we'll let the uh, conversation sort of lead you as to why uh, the two are related. But the Tigers of Memphis, the Memphis Tigers, were a uh, professional football team uh, in the late 20s and early uh, 1930s, uh, the height of the Depression uh, of course, economically, but uh, were part of uh, a, a relatively ragtag uh, world of professional football at that time with uh, a fledgling, uh, and that's being frankly quite charitable, North, Amer- North American, NFL, too much soccer on the mind, NFL National Football League, uh, but also uh, a lot of independent teams and other uh, attempts and tries to uh, potentially challenge the NFL, which was clearly not nearly as uh, uh, the dominant force uh, as it is today. Uh, the Memphis Tigers is our uh, focus. The pre-NFL uh, 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 Memphis Tigers, they never actually did play in the NFL, but uh, uh, the, the history of the NFL is absolutely tied up in this uh, interesting story. Uh, our guest today is Wiley McClellan, and the book he has written is called Tigers by the River, uh, a true and accurate tale of the early years of professional football. I found this conversation really intriguing, and uh, and the book uh, as well. And if you call yourself a uh, an early pro football uh, fan, uh, I, I really recommend this book as a uh, as a good uh, fodder for uh, your uh, enjoyment and uh, for, to solidify your uh, your knowledge of uh, of the early days uh, of the NFL and beyond. Uh, before we get there, we want to uh, quickly remind you that our uh, our show, is, uh, as often, uh, is uh, sponsored by our friends at Audible, uh, where you can get an audio book for free, right? An audio book for free, a free download for your choosing from over 180,000 titles. Uh, and if you go to uh, audibletrial.com slash good seats, uh, that is the place where you can uh, get your free trial. Uh, you get 30 days of the Audible service. You get a free audio book download. Uh, you can cancel at any time. Uh, and you will also be benefiting the show just a little bit uh, by doing so. If you don't uh, enjoy audiobooks now on your device, um, you uh, are missing out. Uh, there's some amazing, uh, well-read stories, uh, both of fiction and nonfiction, you name the topic. And there are over 180,000 titles and counting uh, that Audible has within its uh, nest of intrigue uh, that uh, you can choose from. So why not give Audible a trial uh, and why not uh, get your free audiobook download to see what I'm talking about? That's audibletrial.com slash good seats. Again, audibletrial.com slash good seats for your free audiobook download and uh, trial of the Audible service. Thank you, Audible, again for your sponsorship of the show. We uh, appreciate it. And uh, we appreciate you listening, of course. And now let us waste little time, no more time, 
uh, into our conversation, which will begin now with Wiley McClellan, the topic being the Tigers by the River, the story of the Memphis Tigers uh, of the early days of professional football here on The Big Podcast. So let me just uh, get some, uh, uh, I guess, some prelude. So I'm really curious as to uh, before we get into the the story of the Tigers in Memphis and and the origins, I think, I guess, of of what is now known as today's professional NFL football. Uh, how did you come across the topic and uh, passionate enough to uh, commit some time and effort to to writing a a, a, a nice tome about uh, about those early days in Memphis? Well. I was born in Memphis, but I spent my boyhood in Indianapolis. My father had a business, and he loved the Chicago Bears. And so I loved the Chicago Bears, too. And I used to – I was really a fanatic, a a young sports fanatic, loved all sports, and especially the Chicago Bears. And uh, I was glued to the TV on their games. And when they – won the National Football League title in 1963, we were at the game against the New York Giants in Wrigley Field. And it was a very exciting event. And Daddy told me that one of the best professional football teams in history were the Memphis Tigers. He said they beat the Bears and they beat the Green Bay Packers. And they had uh, Hall of Fame players on their roster. And I kind of, I didn't disbelieve him, but I was skeptical about it. And years later, when I began to to write fiction, I had the idea, I started writing a novel about a a young man in Memphis um, who becomes heartbroken when the quarterback of the NFL team in Memphis, a fictional team, is uh, so severely injured that his career in football is ended and I wanted some more background information and I began to uh, I remember my father telling me about this team that was in Memphis in the, in the late 20s and early 30s and I went to the library and there wasn't anything there there was nothing about them there uh, the archivist John Harkins who taught me high school history did some research and he came back with a small article in one of the newspapers that had been one of the newspapers about Zach Curlin naming the University of Memphis athletic teams after this team, after this old professional team. And um, that made me even more curious. And so I just went back into the microfilm of the old newspapers and uh, dug the whole story out. Well, that's uh, so um, a couple of things. So uh, one, uh, you sort of glossed over uh, uh, your your father's uh, um, uh, business. So do you want to, there's a little interesting story there as to what that business was, right? Well, it was the, it was a Howard Johnson, Howard Johnson Motor Lodge and Restaurant. My, fa- my grandfather owned a motel in, in Memphis. He owned motels in Memphis and Nashville. And he got into, uh, Howard Johnson was looking, this was in the very early 50s, Howard Johnson was looking to get into the motel business and he and my grandfather somehow connected. And so, uh, grandpa sold the the motels in Memphis and in Nashville and they did a study. Howard Johnson wanted to make sure that the first motel he built was going to be successful. And they did a, a study for sites and they picked Indianapolis because it was a, uh, very vibrant, a uh, town with every kind of economy, you know, they had uh, manufacturing, agriculture, and distribution, and it was a busy crossroads. And so they built this in 1954. And of course, my grandpa, he, my grandfather needed my father. He was, they were in business together. And so we moved to Indianapolis. But I think that my father's original love of the Chicago Bears came from when they played this old team in Memphis. Because he said every time the Chicago Bears came to town, he was at those games. So as you delved into the story, right, so it probably 
my assumption is that one of the reasons why it was relatively hard to immediately find information, and again, of course, this is in the days way before the internet even existed, right? So yeah, uh, m- my sense is that um, part of the problem was the fact that the, the Tigers of Memphis weren't officially or even, uh, you know, even in back then uh, defined as a member of either the NFL or, or the what was regarded as the the largest or most uh, uh, prominent professional uh, football league in the country, right? Because of its relative haphazard and regional kind of dynamic back then, right? Well, you know, like what you have to understand, Tim, is at that time, all of professional football, it was, it was a fledging sport. It was just emerging. It, it wasn't the national football league, first came together in 1920. And uh, even then, it took years before the organization became firm. And of that original meeting in 1920, only two teams, the Chicago Bears and the Chicago Cardinals, still exist today. Green Bay didn't come into it until about 1923. And then the New York Giants didn't come into it until about 1925. And in 19, in the late 20s and early 30s, at the time uh, which my not which the story of the Tigers happened, Green Bay, New York, the Bears, and the Cardinals were the only teams that still exist today that were in the NFL. And it was a total hand-to-mouth operation. I mean, most you know, like very. They really weren't – it was an exciting sport and it was starting to grow. But all of it was loosely organized. Why the Tigers were all but forgotten is an interesting question as you put forth. Um, and I've wondered about that. But they were. They were almost forgotten and yet they were so very good. They were the best professional team in the country in 1929. Well, so let's let's get into that story a little bit. And, and I guess maybe a, a basis of that is that – uh, one of the reasons you could claim that, right, is because these NFL teams, despite being in whatever definition of the league was at that time, were also it was a t- fledging league. Fledging, right? So, but but they were also so they were taking on teams from other sources, right? Either regional leagues or other sort of independents, I guess, right? And that's yes, I yeah. guess where Memphis sort of comes into the crosshairs of some of these teams you're mentioning, right? Yes. Well, Memphis was, uh, they were owned in 1929, they were owned by one of the wealthiest men in the South, a man named Clarence Saunders, and he was the founder of the Piggly Wiggly uh, grocery chain. And he was able to buy, not buy, but, you know, offer the best contracts available to the best players. And when they would play a team, if one of the players on the opposite team was very good, he'd offer him a contract and that player would jump to the Memphis Tigers. And this happened too when they played the when they played Green Bay. They played Green Bay late in the season. Green Bay was the undefeated um, champions of the National Football League that year. And they beat them very soundly. They played them in, it was after the NFL season was officially over. And three of the players on two of the players on that NFL team, Cal Hubbard and John Blood McNally, were offered contracts to play for the Tigers by Clarence Saunders, and they jumped to his team. And the next week they played and beat the Chicago Bears. Contracts weren't so firm back then like they are now. And if you offered a good player enough money, and back then enough money was just a few hundred dollars, they'd jump. So the NFL, in its embryonic state, right, was still not necessarily uh, guaranteed to be see, to be the best "quote unquote" place to play if you were a good player, right? There were plenty of other independent and other teams out there that uh, could offer either on a per diem or, you know, on a shorter term or even more uh, comp- competitive contract to kind of jump, and it was it was kind of almost de rigueur at that point, right? Versus it being yes, heresy. I think that's a pretty good assessment, Tim. I believe you're right. It's very interesting. Like in 1920, when they, when the, when the league was first organized, and it wasn't called the National Football League, 
it was called, the first name they gave it was, um, well, the first name they gave it was, I can't quite remember, but it didn't take the name National Football League until about two years later. And the fellow who was who was sort of in charge decided that each team, in order to be a member of the league, should pay $1,000. And none of that money was ever collected. You know, they were just trying to do that to give it some kind of uh, credibility. And the first person who was named president of that league was Jim Thorpe, not because he was a good administrator, but because he was one of the most famous athletes of that day. And again, it was an attempt to give it some credibility. Sure. But the reason they organized it was so that the teams could have some regular schedules. The problem with being an independent team, it was hard to keep, it was hard to stick to a schedule because so many teams would, would appear and then they, and then they disappear because they didn't have enough money to go on. And that was a problem in the early years of the NFL too. A lot of the teams that were there in 1920, well, as I said, they're all of the teams in 1920, only two exist to this day, you know, the Cardinals and the bears. And money was a big problem back then. And on the other hand, in college, college football was enormously popular. You would have uh, 50,000 people at at some of the big stadiums uh, on college campuses throughout the country on every Saturday of throughout the season. And one of the reasons why professional football began to grow is because the great college players, people remained curious about them after they finished college. And if a professional team could sign a famous college player, that would increase their their gate. So why would a guy like um, Clarence Saunders, uh, you know, with a, a successful grocery uh, uh, enterprise, uh, why would even like why would he even uh, be remotely interested in putting money into a a team in a sport that was so relatively chaotic on a professional level? In 1928, 29. <laughs> That's a good question. Well, initially he did it because he, his son, Lee Saunders, who had played collegiately at the University of Swanee, wanted to play some professional football. And I think that um, I think that Clarence, Mr. Saunders, I think he was kind of an indulgent parent. He had three children, and so he conf- he knew about this professional team that was playing in Memphis from his son, and they were run by a a sports writer named Early Maxwell, and he conferred with Maxwell and took over and took over the team. And he didn't do much with them in 1928, except attend a few games and make sure that his son got to play. But in 1929, the second year, he became very enthusiastic about them. And he had tremendous plans for his team. And he had enough money he was a very wealthy man, you know, like he was one of the wealthiest men in the South. So it didn't bother him to lose money at first. But unfortunately, the Great Depression happened. You know, the markets crashed in the fall of 1929. And within a year, Clarence Saunders was broke and his company had to declare bankruptcy. But the Memphis Tigers kept on because they were so good. And they did attract crowds into the stadium where they played, and it was it was a small stadium by our standards now. It only held about 10,000 people. But in 1930, a group of businessmen in Memphis banded together and formed the Memphis Tigers Association. And they each put in $300 apiece. I think there was about 35 of them that did this, and that was seed money to keep the team going. And they had even better players on their roster than they did in the – Uh, the year before 1929 when they were so very good, but they didn't really have the leadership that, that had been provided to by Clarence Saunders. And so they didn't win as many games, but they were a very good team and they throughout their existence. And they, their final game was in the fall of 1935. They were an excellent professional football team. Well, some of the excellence was uh, on display. You mentioned in 1929, and again, we're, we're talking about a team that was uh, effectively uh, uh, operating as an independent. If I'm not mistaken, uh, according to my research here, I think uh, the Tigers actually played only one game away in in 1929, and all the other games were were home enterprises, right? 
Yes, I think you're right. And the game away, I think was in it was in Nashville. They play this uh, they play this car dealer team in Nashville called the Ogenies. and that was the only game they had away. See, back then, to travel on the road, I mean, like a professional football, when they had a professional football game, if the weather was good, maybe five to ten thousand people came out to see it. And this was true even in the big cities, you know, in Chicago and in Cleveland and, and Green Bay was not a big town. And uh, to travel, you had to meet the travel expenses and maybe you got to have part of the gate. But if you played at home, you didn't have the travel expenses and your part of the gate was gross profit. So it was more economically, it was more feasible to play your games at home. You know, that seems astounding when you, you know, look at it today with all the money that that is in, you know, major professional sports. But back then there were the resources were scant. And it was just beginning to to emerge. And there just wasn't nearly as as much money then as there is now like you have today. Yeah, it almost, it almost feels like a sort of a barnstorming type of element, similar to what you would have experienced, say, with uh, the Negro Leagues in baseball and uh, and some of the other sort of minor uh, uh, baseball uh, teams out at that time of that era. Yeah. Basketball yeah, right. too. Yeah. Uh, so what, but so I guess uh, the, the point I was sort of trying to bring out there is that as you're, as you're talking about the team in 1930, that is essentially reconstituted or at least new ownership, right? You're coming off right. of a, uh, a wave of, um, of success. I mean, they played the bears, uh, the Chicago, the NFL Chicago bears uh, twice in 29, losing the first time, but winning, the second time, as well as beating the uh, the Green Bay Packers re- relatively handily. So clearly, yeah. even though it's an independent, I don't know, one-off type of game per se, um, and I guess you could question whether the NFL teams, uh, quote unquote, took it seriously or 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 did take it seriously, and it truly was, um, uh, you know. But in in terms of Memphis's, uh, you know, season and and performance, uh, you know, those are two. Uh, major uh, feathers in their cap, right? And it almost seems that, at least on the field, uh, 1930 would be even bigger and better and, you know, perhaps even more, quote-unquote, professional going forward, no? Well, you know, I think they had better players than a 1930 team. But the difference was, if you look at it closely, was leadership and management. Clarence Saunders provided dynamic leadership both on and off the field to his football team. And when he left, they gave the, the coaching duties to a, a very good player named Larry Betancourt. Larry Betancourt was one of the best linemen of that era. After, you know, later he played with the green Bay Packers for three years and Betancourt was a very good player, but he was a lousy coach. And, uh, also he, it just didn't work out so well. So they began to lose some games. They won most of their games in 1930, but they lost about four or five games, which the team in 1929, you know, they only lost once. And uh, the team in 1929 kept getting better. Whereas the team in 1930 started off very good. They beat a very good NFL team, the Portsmouth Spartans. And after that, they started going downhill. They they made a trip up to Chicago and played the Chicago Cardinals with Ernie Nevers in Comiskey Stadium. And they were given a good guarantee. So they made a little money on that trip, but the Cardinals beat them very badly. And uh, they just, on the field, they weren't as good. The following year, they rebounded on the field. They were under the leadership of early Max of early Maxwell, and they didn't have as good a as strong a roster as they had in 1930. But they won their first eight games, and they won them impressively. And then they played some NFL teams. I think they played the uh, Brooklyn Dodgers, which was an NFL team back then. They got beat, but they put up a good fight, and they played it. They played another NFL team. I can't remember exactly which one it was. And they were beaten again. I think it might have been the Cardinals. 
and they were beaten again, but they put up good fights in both those teams, and they were considered to be the best independent professional football team in America in 1931. See, so that's interesting, right? So the, the, the fact that they were being accorded and, – and look, I think another thing which we really haven't touched on yet is that uh, the NFL, as well as professional football more broadly to the extent that you know other teams aside from the NFL were part of that mixture, uh, was largely still a northeastern and or midwestern kind of uh, in, uh, scenario. And, and you're talking now about a team in Memphis, right, which was – one of a small handful or smaller handful of teams that were outside of that geography in the United States. Yes. Yes, it was. The professional football really grew in the, in the big cities of the Midwest and the Northeast. You know, they had the population um, and they had the manufacturing, the wealth to support professional sports. Keep in mind, baseball, you know, in the 1920s was was as popular, even more popular than college football. But, you know, like even with professional baseball, like the National League and the American League, which was already I mean, they were well organized and it was uh, they were a mature professional sport. There weren't many teams outside of the Midwest and the Northeast. There weren't any professional major league professional baseball teams in the South. And they had yet to get out to the West Coast. It was all in the Midwest and in the Northeast where the population and the manufacturing and the wealth was. They had, because of their manufacturing, they had a, uh, a more seasoned, larger, better organized labor force. And these people had better paychecks than their counterparts in the South. And they could afford to buy a ticket to a professional baseball game or a professional football game on the weekends. And at this time in the, in the early thirties, you began to see a slow growth of professional football. And in the book, you know, I, I brought out, tried to, I brought out some of these things like, like in 1930, the football they played with was, it wasn't yet tapered for the past. It was still kind of fat and you could do drop kicking. But at a meeting in 1934 or 30, I think it was in the summer of 34, the NFL, which was becoming stronger and becoming better organized, they started changing rules like they tapered the ball to the, to the form that it is now. And it eliminated drop kicking forever. You couldn't drop kick. You can't really drop kick the modern football like you could the one before it. But they did that so that the passing game could come more into play because passing was exciting. Offense was exciting. And uh, they also moved the goal post. They moved the goal post up to the goal line. And there's been a few changes to that since then, but they moved the goal post up the goal line so that there could be more field goals, which was done by place kicking. And they also shortened the, uh, they moved where the line of play was it used to be that, you know, where the ball, where the person was tackled, that's where the next play would start. And that was kind of awkward. So they moved the, the yardstick more to the middle of the field. You know, like if some guy got tackled at the sidelines, the play would start near the center of the field. They wouldn't start it at that sideline. It seems odd, but, you know, that's, but that's how it was back then. And there were many changes. The sport matured. From what you can tell in your in your research, though, as these games were being played, and obviously uh, as a um, uh, an independent yet you know dominant and and well regarded independent team, uh, was there any uh, evidence of having to I don't know negotiate the rules or or potentially some of those rules that weren't uh, you know necessarily fully formed, or or was it always sort of uh, the NFL rules, I guess, as the uh, as the the demarcation of, of how the game would be played or, or was there real conjecture and maybe, you know, variance? <laughs> no, <laughs> they pretty much went by the NFL rules because uh, some of these independent teams wanted to be in the NFL. That was their goal. And some of them made it like there was a team in St. Louis uh, called the Gunners and they made it into the NFL, but they only lasted about a year. Um, the Tigers were offered a franchise in the NFL at the end of 1930, but there just wasn't enough money in professional football 
to interest the owners into into taking that franchise. They didn't want to pay five thousand dollars to enter the league, and then lose go through another money losing season like they had in 1930. And um, that was endemic throughout the professional game. I think the Chicago Bears, they were probably one of the first teams to start making money regularly. But for a long time with them, it was hand to mouth. And when, when the league was first formed, George Hallis sold cars and his partner, uh, Sterneman, he worked in a filling station. They had part, you know, they had part-time jobs in addition to owning and running and playing professional football. And Curly Lambeau, who was the coach of the Green Bay Packers, sold men's clothing. You know, it was a hand-to-mouth operation for almost the first 15 years. Then, in, you know, as the league became more firm and they, they put out better rules and they began to not only require, if you wanted to enter the league, you had to pay a fee. And if you, and if you didn't pay the fee, then you, they weren't going to let you in. As it grew, some of the teams started making some money. But it was really, really hand to mouth. I mean, the growth was slow. It became, started to become steady because it was an exciting sport. But it was very slow. So in the early 30s, as, as the Tigers uh, continued to kind of make their way through year to year with sort of I don't call it wobbly finances, but certainly wasn't uh, the epitome of stability, right? Um, what uh, Give us a sense of, um, you know, getting into like 32 and 33. I mean, it seems like uh, I'm wondering, given that uh, opportunity back a number of years earlier in, the th- in 1930 that you're mentioning to go to the NFL, I'm wondering that if uh, the owners, depending on the year, uh, saw a maybe uh, path to a second chance to eventually get to the NFL as that firmness was starting to happen in that league? You know, looking back on it, the opportunity that was offered to them in 1930, they didn't see it as the great opportunity that the NFL became in the 50s and 60s. Only the very passionate men like George Hallis, Tim Mara, Curly Lambeau, only those very passionate men, and later George Preston Marshall, believed in the future of professional football. And they staked their entire lives upon it. And, but most people, you know, professional football was, wasn't that big a deal at all. You know, they had other things on their mind. And, now, Clarence Saunders, he became passionate about it, but then he went broke, and he couldn't do any more with it. And um, some of the men who, like Early Maxwell, was passionate about it, but they're just, it was not a money-making proposition. As good a team as he was able to put on the field, he didn't get enough gate. He, he paid all the bills, and everyone got, their, got paid what their contract stated, but he came out of there with he didn't come out of there with enough money to, to keep him interested in having another team the next year. It was a really hard go in those years. And if you go to 19, I got this book right in front of me. If we go to 1930, and I'll give you a list of the teams that were in the NFL. Okay. All right, 1932, there were eight teams in the NFL. Chicago Bears, Green Bay Packers, Portsmouth Spartans, Boston Braves, New York Giants, Brooklyn Dodgers, Chicago Cardinals, and Stapleton. And of those eight, only four are still in the league. The Bears, Green Bay, Giants, and the Chicago Cardinals. The Chicago Cardinals are the Arizona Cardinals now. That's what we're looking at, you know. In 1930... There were 11 teams in the NFL, Green Bay, New York Giants, Chicago Bears, Brooklyn Dodgers, Providence Steamrollers, Stapleton, Chicago Cardinals, Portsmouth Spartans, Frankfurt Yellow Jackets, Minneapolis, and Newark. And then on the next year, 1931, 
they dropped back down to 10. You know, this is, that's what it was like back then, Tim. Teams faded. Most teams did not make money. And I mean, when I say most teams, I mean maybe one or two teams were making money. The rest were not, and they couldn't, they couldn't support themselves. Okay, friends, sorry for the interruption. Just wanted to quickly remind you that today's episode of Good Seat Still Available is brought to you by our friends at Audible, the premier provider of digital audiobooks with over 180,000 titles to choose from in just about every genre you could think of. Audible titles play on iPhone, Kindle, Android, and more than 500 devices and MP3 players for listening anytime, anywhere. And for a limited time, my audience can listen to a free download of any book that they choose, as well as get a 30-day free trial when you go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats. That's audibletrial.com slash goodseats. And you can choose from over 180,000 titles, as we said, including uh, one that I'm listening to right now. It's called The Ten Gallon War by John Eisenberg. That's the story of the NFL's Cowboys, the AFL's Texans, and the feud for Dallas's pro football future. Um, another one on my list, which I have yet to download, but is on my queue uh, that could be interesting to our audience here is called The National Forgotten League by Dan Daly. Entertaining stories and observations from pro football's first 50 years. Those are just two of the many thousands of titles to choose from, and not just in sports history, but you name the genre that uh, you might want to listen to and Audible's got it. By the way, two, uh, two guests, perhaps, that we'll have on the show hopefully sometime soon. But again, go to audibletrial.com slash good seats for your free 30 day trial, as well as your free audiobook download to try it out for yourself. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash good seats. And now back to our conversation. Yeah, it would seem though, right? Uh, Assuming the team in Memphis on the field was stable and was still a draw and was still a potentially viable enterprise, assuming the right finances behind it, um, you, you describe those teams in the NFL, uh, and maybe the vision wasn't there. Maybe the economy, certainly with the with the depression, uh, couldn't support it. But but I guess it, you look at it down, you know, through the the lens of history, you you see, at least I do, is geography, right? And in this case, uh, a Memphis being uh, a, a bit of an expansion, shall we say, geographically. And again, maybe this is too early for people to see, given the the day to day realities of you know depression, uh, economy, United States, right? But um, you know, I, given that sort of level of strength in that sort of northeast midwestern corridor, uh, you'd think that uh, a team that's relatively stable, at least on the field, a uh, competitive and, and arguably uh, well regarded independent team, would be something of an asset to be coveted perhaps by some of those NFL owners of vision, but maybe it just wasn't there yet. I think that that's exactly right. I think that you have it right there. Exactly. George Hallis, who was really, the real leaders back then were George Hallis and Tim Mara and George Preston Marshall. There were others, but those three were the most prominent. George Preston Marshall owned the, uh, he owned the Boston Braves. And they weren't doing well in Boston. The Memphis Tigers played the Boston Braves twice to scoreless ties. This was in 1932. And they had good players on that team, very good players. Some of them are in the Hall of Fame, but they weren't doing well. And George Preston Marshall owned a chain of laundries. I think it was in Washington, D.C. So he moved them from Boston. And I think it was about 1930, in the mid-30s sometime. And he renamed them the Redskins. And he was passionate about that sport and about his team. And, uh, of course, we know what happened with the Washington Redskins. And uh, Tim Mara, who owned the New York Giants, he was passionate about it. And, of course, George Hallis. And these men organized, were always looking to improve the game. They were always looking for, uh, for opportunity. And, you know, I think the South was just not ready. Outside of, you know, the Northeast Midwest corridor, the rest of the country was just not quite ready to expand for the expansion of professional sports in general. 
Well, yeah. So I, that's fair enough. So let's, but let's, so let's uh, maybe get to 1933 because it, in my mind, it seems like this is a bit of a, of a pivotal year and or uh, consideration because uh, S.A. Goodman had had come back, uh, I guess, as sort of the the owner or the sole owner of the team at, at that point. But it almost seems like the the thought was maybe this could indeed be a professional uh, league bound. Uh, opportunity again, but but not maybe necessarily with the NFL, but through some other mechanisms by which to compete at a similar level as the NFL. Do you want to maybe yeah. get into some of the seeds of, of that and, and how Memphis well, perhaps was going to be professional uh, in a pro pro circuit? Yeah, that's that's an excellent question. Professional football, like as we've been talking about, it was growing ever so slowly, but it was growing. And the National Football League was starting to get get some legs, even though most of the teams that were playing then, you know, were were not going to be playing, you know, later. But they were starting to get some legs, and some and people were starting to go to professional football games every week. And people like S. A. Godman, there were other professional teams in the South too, and they were independent. He looked up and he saw how, you know, that this was happening. It was happening with the, you know, the National Football League because they could provide schedules and stability. So his idea and other people's idea was to form a league in the South. And they did that the next year. It was called the American Football League. And they had teams in, they had teams in Dallas, Memphis. They had one in Oklahoma. They had one in Charlotte, North Carolina. They had one in, started off in Kansas City, and then they moved to St. Louis. And uh, they had one in Louisville, too. I think there were originally eight teams, and then that fell down to six at the start of the season. And they were able to provide regular schedules at the start of the season. See, when a perfect, you know, when an independent team started off each season, they didn't really have a set schedule. They had to take games as they came along. Right. But the American Football League gave every team in that league a set schedule. The crowds were bigger, but again, they weren't big enough. And George Hallis was delighted with this attempt, and he want, he, he even he thought that it was going to be a, a great success. I don't know if he really thought it was, but he gave word in newspapers that like look to the South, they're going to have a great success with the professional football because he saw the success of professional football in the South as the success of professional football as a whole. And he well, could keep on and his teams and, and his gate could keep on growing. Well, OK, so let's, let's stop there for the second. So so that seems a little odd, maybe in, in again, through the retrospective of time. Why would a George Hallis with an NFL and again, maybe because it's still early and formative it seems a little odd, at least in, in that framework, that he would actually think that that would be a good thing uh, versus, say, being a competitive thing. Well, <laughs> Hallis was a warrior, all right. And uh, he had there had been a league, like when he signed Red Grange in 1925, Red Grange had an agent named Cash and Kerry Pyle. And when Hallis wouldn't meet uh, the contract that Cash and Kerry Powell wanted after the, you know, after he'd first signed him, after they'd played a few games, Cash and Kerry Powell took Red Grange and they, he formed his own league around Red Grange and they lasted about a year. Um, but when Godman and these others formed the American Football League in the South, they made it clear to the NFL that they weren't in competition. You know, they were not going to go, they weren't playing in the Midwest and in the Northeast cities. They were playing in the Southern cities. And they made that clear. And I think that Hallis, who was not, Hallis was for the growth of professional football. He saw the growth of professional football meant the growth of the Chicago Bears in the National Football League. And uh, and maybe he saw, you know, he was a visionary kind of person. And he saw that if, the, if professional football ex- succeeded in the South and it had a better chance of succeeding with the league, and maybe down the years, they could arrange something. Yeah, but go, not, go ahead, Tim. I'm sorry, but not to the point though of financial support or any of that. No, kind he of didn't stuff. do that. Yeah, 
No, he didn't. He didn't do that. He didn't give them any financial support. But he thought it was a great opportunity for football in the South. So, so it and seems like yeah, it seems like S.A. Goodman then uh, became pretty much the uh, the flame carrier for this because obviously Memphis, the team, the Tigers were you know essentially the Probably. Well, I don't know. Were they the strongest independent team in the South at that point? It seemed like there were at least a few others that were kind of uh, getting some similar credibility, right? They were they, are, they were probably the, the strongest. They had the best players, but everything changed from year to year so much. I mean, like Bucky Moore, who was their great halfback, and Bucky Moore was one of the best running backs in the nation at that time. He played. Bucky Moore played for them in 29 and in 30. In 1934, when they formed the American League, he was playing and coaching for the Louisville team. I think they were called the Louisville Bourbons. Bucky Moore was, had, you know, he was playing for the opponent. And uh, Larry Betancourt, uh, who played, who was also a baseball player, he no longer played with them. He quit playing for them after the 30 season, and he went up and he was playing for Green Bay. And... Uh, Players jumped around a lot. It was uh, rosters changed so much from year to year. And I think this was even true with, with a lot of the NFL teams. One thing that back then that they didn't want to do is they didn't want to recruit college players because they didn't want to cause, stir any kind of trouble, you know, with, with the National Collegiate Athletic Association. They wanted, they wanted to remain free of any controversy in that regard. And the NFL had a policy back then of hands off all football players and then playing collegiately. And so the American Football League took that same policy. And, and they, think, Yeah, I'm sorry. I think it's important also to just throw a quick uh, qualifier here. Right? So as people yell at their devices as they're listening to this uh, intently, the American Football League is, a, is an appellation that uh, has it's been numerous in, uh, in pro football history. Right. So you're right. Just yeah. put, it in, put it in context. <laughs> 1926 was the first uh, per major uh, recognition of, of, a, of an entity called the American Football League. And then this was right. really, I guess, the second uh, entity to take that name. But arguably, in, in, in retrospect in history, it, it is perceived as a, quote unquote, minor league at the time. And there were, you know, but, but there have been other attempts with the name American Football League. I just got to throw that out there as a as Yeah, a there were. There was one, I believe, a couple of years later. I don't know much about it, but then, of course, there was the AFL that was organized by uh, Lamar Hunt and uh, some other very prominent men in 1960. Right. That was number four, the number four yeah. attempt. And the one you're referencing is actually the number two attempt or was now uh, agreed upon as being the AFL two from 36 to 37. Anyway, yeah. I, I digress, but it's an important point. But I, right, I, it I, is. Yeah. I, I, so I, but it seems to me, though, that um, uh, that. Uh, you had uh, an owner in Goodman uh, who I guess he became not only the flag bearer for the league, but also for the team. How, he kind of gravitates more towards trying to organize this this league from Memphis uh, going forward, right to the point where he helps it basically launch the league in the, in the following year in 1934. Yes. Yes, he did. I think he saw he you know, an opportunity because he, you know, like uh, the NFL – did see some growth. It was growing and it was becoming popular. Mostly it was popular among the working class people, people who worked in those factories. You know, they saw, they identified with these football players, the hard, rough game, and they enjoyed it. Uh, Al Capone, the big gangster, he loved professional football. And they were starting to get some stars. And it was also starting to be recognized by sports writers that just because you had been very good in college didn't necessarily mean you were going to make it in the NFL. A lot of college All-Americans came in the NFL, and they, didn't, they weren't as good as they had been in college. Professional football was starting to really develop as a sport in the early 30s. And I, Godman saw this, and he, wanted, he saw an opportunity for a Southern League. And most of the players that were on the rosters of these Southern teams were the discards of the NFL teams. You know, like they'd send some manager up to the North and he'd sign players who had been cut by the 
the NFL teams, and they'd come down and, and play. There was a lineman with the Tigers named Champ Seabold, and he was a rookie from the University of Wisconsin, and he was a great big guy. He was like 6'4", and he weighed 235 pounds, which was an enormous man back then. And the Packers, I believe, deliberately sent him down to Memphis for a little seasoning. And when the season was over, he went back, uh, he rejoined the Packers, and he was a star in the NFL during the 30s. And a lot of those players that played in the uh, Southern American Football League, to give it a, you know, to the distinction, they went on and they starred in the NFL in the following years. There was a quarterback for the team for the Kansas City. I can't right, quite think of his name right now. It might come to me, but he was a very talented player, and he, he went and played in the NFL in the 30s, and he was a star. And um, I think their status was, as you said, it was minor league in the hope of becoming major league. But there wasn't enough money. The you know they were the country was still in the throes of the depression, and the and the South didn't have the the population and the and the manufacturing and the middle class didn't have enough wealth in the middle class to support professional football or any other really major professional sport. So describe then that it was it would seem to me that uh, that 1934 would have been. The best shot uh, to challenge the NFL as a league, uh, Memphis to be part of that challenger league. Um, maybe you want to describe sort of 1934, which frankly I think kind of uh, was the uh, the the ultimate demise of the team uh, for good, uh, despite the uh, intentions. Well, 1934, Tim started off really good. Uh, the the sports reporters in Memphis were excited about it. Like early Maxwell wrote about it. And, uh, they had a player named Walter. They had a, a, a wonderful writer for the commercial appeal named Walter Stewart. And he was the sports edi editor for, for one of the newspapers. And he wrote well about them and they were excited about it. And a lot of the teams had, had started off with some pretty good financial backing. Like there was a wealthy woman in, uh, who owned the Dallas team. She was the daughter of a, uh, of, a, of an oil man, and uh, her name was Glima Orr, and the, the Memphis team moved from Hodges Field to the bigger stadium, Russwood, just a few blocks away, that had covered stands, and um, many of the politicians in Memphis, like E.H. Crump, who was, uh, who was the political boss there, he always attended Tiger Games. The first few games, I think they got some good crowds. One of the problems back then in all of professional football was the crowd that they attracted on Sunday was weather dependent. If it was a rainy Sunday day, that would keep down attendance. And this was true even in, in the NFL, where you had these huge stadiums like Wrigley Field and Comiskey Park. If you had a rainy Sunday and the Bears were playing the Brooklyn Dodgers, You'd still get, you know, and it was raining really hard. You might get, you were lucky if you got 5,000 people in that huge cavernous stadium. And it was even more so in the South. I mean, like, if you had a rainy Sunday, you know, the game sale came on Sunday. You, they didn't, I mean, they tried to sell, they had some season tickets available and they sold a few of those, but, but most of your big sales came on the day of the game. And if it was a rainy day, People stayed inside, and rather than go to the ballpark, if they if they were interested, they'd listen to it on the radio. That hurt at the gate. Nowadays, they're playing in these big, huge covered stadiums, and uh, one of the reasons they have these covered stadiums is so that you know the rain's not going to affect attendance. And it was just you know like it was a magnificent effort, but it just it failed because because of the depression. And I guess really the South, you know, I keep repeating this, but I, it's true, wasn't yet ready for major professional sports. When did they finally get a major league baseball team? When did that happen? I guess it was Atlanta or maybe Houston. 
the Astros. I'm not sure, but it wasn't really until the, the early 60s. Isn't that correct? Yeah, I think that's largely true. Um, you know, and uh, it's, you know, again, I, I think and I, we've we've explored some of this with um, with baseball at the time, too. I, I do think the uh, the uh, the long lasting effects of of uh, in through the good part of the 1930s. I mean, the Depression certainly was something that, um, you know, was not just a stock market crash in 29. Right. It had long standing, lingering effects. And it was, uh, you know, in many respects, almost a reset of the the, the nation's economy. Uh, yeah. At the time in pro sports, you know, it's not as it was not the industrial complex that it is today. Um, yeah. But it did seem, I guess, coming going into 1935, it did seem that uh, there was going to be a second year of this league, uh, minor league or, uh, a, a, you know, a t- a attempted professional competitor league, uh, you know, debated. Uh, but it, it never it, it seemed like there was there were delays to get uh, the league uh, up and going for the second season. And it kind of just kind of collapsed upon itself. And they're yes, taking the did. Tigers with them. And the reason for it was because of was money. There just wasn't enough money to make it go. They were losing money. And, and uh, the people just didn't, they, they lost interest because of that. The people who could, would finance a team lost interest because of that. But a couple of the old players kept it going a little bit longer. And uh, they, they played a couple of games in, in the fall of 1935, but... Again, attendance was, you know, I mean, they were drawing just, you know, a thousand people at the most, and that wasn't enough. Well, as you, as you, you know, did your, your work and your investigation. So, uh, you know, it seems to me that that was almost the, um, I don't want to say the death knell, but it certainly, it did put a damper on uh, Memphis's um, opportunities and or attempts to become a professional football town and arguably something that still eludes uh, the city today. But, you know, we've seen this uh, again and again with other uh, fledgling uh, challenger professional football leagues. Memphis is always on that short list, probably alongside Birmingham, uh, yeah. for for consideration, right? And obviously the Memphis Tigers uh, collegiate team uh, has had uh, pockets of success over the years and NFL players and all that. But um, do you think in your because you've studied so much on this topic, do you think that, and I know this is revisionist, right? But do you think that if Memphis had somehow, uh, you know, stayed on, hung on, maybe less as an independent, but as either part of a challenger league or maybe had been part of the NFL and stuck around, I know this is sort of a bit assumptive, uh, that perhaps it could be a different story? Or do you think, to your point earlier, that Memphis just wasn't ready at the time and, and maybe it, not, it would not have worked? Memphis was just not ready at the time. The real chance that they had was through Clarence Saunders. He was a very wealthy man, and he and he, you can tell that he loved that team and he loved the sport. He loved the engagement of it, and he was a great promoter too. He knew how to promote things. If he hadn't gone broke, he would have kept that team going, and he might have even made a success of them. He announced in the papers in 1929, see, Hallis invited him into the NFL unofficially. You know, if he wanted to be in the NFL, he probably could have been because they wanted men. They wanted wealthy, exuberant men like Sarah Clarence Saunders in the NFL. And at the, of that day, in that day, he was a very famous man. He was a real mogul, but he was overextended in business. I think he had a lot of loans out. I'm not sure about this. But he got caught, you know, with that with the depression, and so he went broke. Uh, but had he not gone broke, you know, had he been had enough reserves, he was planning on building a big stadium in Memphis. He announced that in the papers, and he was going to play all his games at home. Again, you know, it's more economic for a team to play at home because they 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 were assured of a gate there, and they didn't have travel expenses. And they could bring in a good team by paying them a guarantee. And him being the promotional genius that he was, who knows? Maybe he could have drawn 20,000 people to each game and made a lot of money, you know. But their real opportunity, when he lost his money, that was when the opportunity for the Memphis Tigers, you know, that was their 
their big demise. And uh, I think that, you know, the, in the South, you just didn't have the population and, and man, you know, and manufacturing and, and the wealth that a big manufacturers like they had in the North can give to the middle class. You didn't have that in the South so much as you did in the North. Last question. Um, uh, what have you seen, if anything, from uh, the university uh, in Memphis or uh, other uh, other teams or whatever in terms of their uh, memory or uh, deference or uh, heritage link uh, to the Tigers uh, by the river, as you uh, 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 label the book, um, or or have they largely still been forgotten um, and and not you know remembered? Well, the the uh, the head of the history department at the University of Memphis he did an interview with me, uh, and I'll send you that link, Tim. You know, I'll send you that link. And uh, he was quite thrilled that someone managed to dig all this up. The story behind the University of Memphis and the Memphis Tigers. In 1929, when the Tigers were really a, you know, a very good and a thrill to watch, one of the men who refereed their games was a fellow named Zach Curlin. In the next year, in 1930, he was hired by what was then West Tennessee State Teachers College as the athletic director. And uh, he decided to name the athletic teams after, after the Tigers because they, you know, they had such a, a fine winning spirit about them and they were the best professional football team in the nation in 1929. And he thought that, you know, in honor of, of that spirit, of that winning drive, he wanted to name his college athletic teams after them. And now that college is the University of Memphis, and the athletic teams are still the Tigers. There is a street that runs through the University of Memphis on their eastern boundary called Zach Curlin Boulevard, named in honor of, of the original athletic director there. And most people have really forgotten that. They didn't realize that, you know, the the Memphis athletic teams, the Tigers, were named after the sole professional football team owned by a very wealthy man. So in the interview, the, uh, the head of the history department, Dr. Aram, he, he brought that out in the interview. And he was delighted to, that some light had been cast upon this. So there's an official link then of the Memphis Tigers uh, of the old fledgling American <laughs> Football League and prior to today's University of Memphis Tigers athletic program. Yeah, and they're going to roar this year, too, I hear. <laughs> well, we shall see as, as college football season gets ready to, to gear up in the next couple of weeks. And um, um, look, Wiley, I, I got to thank you uh, a, a bunch for uh, taking uh, a good hour or so to have a, a, a very interesting conversation. And I will tell you, you know, we're not necessarily um, – spending a whole lot of time in our little journey into forgotten teams and leagues and stuff in the, let's call them minor or other than full-fledged professional uh, teams and entities. But um, this one struck me as being an interesting, um, I don't know, proto perhaps uh, or, or primordial uh, part of what is today's NFL, right? Because football did exist uh, before the uh, advent of the NFL and certainly the NFL uh, was not what it is today back in the 20s and 30s. And uh, it's really important, I think, as uh, even though Memphis uh, didn't rise to the level of being a an NFL franchise per se, uh, the uh, the existence of this team uh, and its role in professional football at that time, including uh, some major games against uh, top NFL uh, teams, and its almost uh, ability to become a a full fledged pro uh, competitor team to uh, that of the NFL, um, it's it's an interesting part of the the overall fabric of, of pro football, and I think it's a really uh, compelling one to uh, uh, to consider. So I, I you know, my, uh, I urge our listeners to uh, to seek out the book. It is called "Tigers by the River: A True and Accurate Tale of the Early Years of Professional Football." Uh, it is published by Sunbury Press. Uh, it is available wherever, as they say, good books are found, and of course, that'll be on our website as well for a one-click purchase opportunity. And uh, I, I can't uh, thank you enough for uh, for taking time to regale us with some of this and hopefully a couple of books and uh, rediscoveries are 
are uh, been are a lot a of fun, of Tim. Been a lot of fun. Thank you very much. My pleasure. I look forward to keeping in touch too. Yeah, I do too. Go Tigers. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Go Tigers. There's our uh, chat with uh, with Wiley McClellan. Uh, thank you, uh, Wiley, for that uh, interesting conversation. And again, I've, I've taken some liberty here, uh, as as I'm want to do on this show. It is my show for for uh, for God's sakes. Uh, the um, uh, we tr- tend to kind of focus on uh, teams and leagues that uh, you know were truly quote unquote professional, either as a challenger or uh, as part of. Uh, you know, major uh, uh, leagues that are uh, were you know established mm-hmm. at, at some point. Uh, there's no hard and fast rule to that. And in this case, I made a, a, a great exception for it because I thought it was important, uh, an interesting story as well. Uh, that that certainly doesn't hurt. Uh, about uh, the early days of the NFL, really, which was reflected in the story of these uh, Memphis Tigers, even though they never were in the NFL uh, themselves, uh, they never were in. I guess what could be considered a major professional challenger league, although uh, the it being called the American Football League, the second uh, use of that name in the history books, um, you know, it's still important and uh, and overlapping with some of those early formative days of the NFL. Thus, a uh, a worthwhile uh, chat and uh, and uh, story uh, to explore. So I thank our guest Wiley McClellan uh, tremendously for being part of. Our little journey together in podcast land. The book uh, he wrote is called Tigers by the River, uh, a true and accurate tale of the early years of professional football. Uh, It is published by Sunbury Press. Uh, You can find it, as they say, wherever good books are found. And, of course, you can find a link to uh, the purchase of said book and all its various forms on our beloved website. Of course, that's goodseatsstillavailable.com. Please, indeed, go check it out, and uh, I think you'll uh, enjoy a little bit of... uh, the stuff we have for you there, including all the past episodes and, and all that fun stuff. Uh, if uh, you would uh, be kind enough to also give us a follow on various forms of social media, that's a good way to stay connected with us. And uh, and we certainly love your love there. Uh, and that's uh, on Twitter. You can find us at Good Seats Still. Uh, on Instagram, you will find us at Good Seats Still Available. Uh, you will find a book, uh, Facebook. That's what I'm trying to say. Facebook page devoted to the show, uh, of course. And, uh, of course, if you're uh, uh, downloading or recording or subscribing, uh, please give us a a review. Rate us, if if you will, as well. Uh, If that's on iTunes, sorry, Apple Podcasts, whatever the name of that is this week, uh, that's a good place to do it. But anywhere else that you're able to review said show, uh, we certainly love uh, that as well. That helps the algorithm. It helps our popularity. We rise on various lists, all that good stuff. Uh, We have a lot more to come in the weeks uh, following. Uh, We're probably going to get a Patreon page up and running. Uh, We've got some other goodies coming. We've got a newsletter coming up. Uh, And as well, of course, some great conversations and interviews. Um, So please be on the lookout for that. And uh, again, keep uh, keep in contact with us and let us know how you're enjoying the show. Uh, We love hearing from uh, the fans. We also love our friends at Podfly Productions, which we don't want to forget, uh, down in Gadsden, Alabama. Uh, the guys down there uh, do a great job in trying to make us as professional as possible, uh, despite my attempts to uh, uh, not do so. Uh, and uh, they know who they are, but you should know who they are as well. That's uh, people like Jerry Payne and David Gregerson and Corey Coates and Eric McGay. Uh, Podfly Productions, if you're interested in your own podcast production uh, help and support and uh, professionalism, uh, podfly.net is the place to go. Podfly, P O D F L Y.net. Visit there early and often and tell them your pal Tim Hanlon and Good Seats Still Available sent you. Okay, I'm done. You're done. We're all done. We'll see you next week. Take care.